so he's he's on a really short leash now. <laughs> oh yes, her son too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. 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 So yeah. without further ado, Pastor Robert. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, he's a graduate, so he's my son now. Yeah. Later on when he does something bad, then he's yours. Right? Did you see what your son did? Uh yeah, isn't that just a thing? Um, well if you would. Hey, good morning. That was actually a pretty good good morning. You, you tried that, did you? Um, well, uh, turn to Acts chapter 5. We have a lot of text to cover today because, you know, just kind of getting into this, I wanted to try and go through the whole thing. Um, once we get towards the end of it, we'll see if I can get through all of the text in this um, because it really is a lot of exposition and talking. Uh, as you're turning, um, I'll, I'll begin with a word of prayer. Father, we just come to you right now and thank you so much just for... Uh, your word, uh, that we can come to it, Lord, that it is uh, full and complete, Lord, even when we are not, even when, uh, Lord, we struggle, we fight, we we try and break against things, Lord, uh, when we are really just wrestling, uh, sometimes, Father, we even wrestle with you. And even at those times, Lord, your word is, is a balm, it's a, sa- it's a salve, it's a, Lord, it's a, an encouragement, it's a rebuke. Uh, Lord, it's everything. And uh, Father, we we don't worship the word. We worship the one that gave us this word, the one that communicates to us through it, Uh, Lord. And it's in these these words here that we find you. Uh, Let us always, when we look at these, Lord, to find Jesus in it, because it is he that is our salvation. So we thank you, Lord, for this time together. Uh, Bless the word in Jesus name. Amen. have you ever done something like perfectly right? Uh, you know, you, you just knew you hit every, you know, you, you crossed every I and dotted every T just like you're supposed to, right? I'm not a graduate. That's Mike. Um, but, you know, it, you do everything right, and, and no matter what you do, it just goes horribly, horribly wrong. That ever happened to you? You know, you're sitting there, and you're cruising along, and everything's just so perfect, and you just know man, I have taken care of everything that needed to be taken care of, and it just craters right into the ground. Well, you know, that's one of the things that's happening with the apostles here. They've done everything perfectly right. They've done exactly what they were told to do. They've done everything they were commanded to do. Uh, And, you know, these guys right now are running around like rock stars, you know what I'm saying? Uh, They're going through the streets, and people are literally lining the streets just so their shadow can touch them, you know? So it's like if there was a, you know, if there was a doing something right award, these guys would be getting it. You know what I'm saying? Um, but yet here they are. They're doing everything right. They're doing everything right. And yet as they come to this, all these sick people coming out, all these people getting healed, miracles happening, and they're preaching in the temple. They're doing exactly what they're called to do. And baslam. We come to Acts chapter 5, verse 17, and the title of my message is Trial, and we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 42. Uh, The first point is going to be got arrested again, on trial again, bailed out again. Uh, It it sounds like some of our lives, right? Um, But... As we go in here, I'll try and keep everything in order as we go through it. But look at verse 17 with me, if you would. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Okay, so right now we're looking at God arrested again, and that's exactly what happens here. Um And the inference, again, here is that they did it in the evening. Because one of the ways that they would do with the Sanhedrin is if they were going to arrest somebody, they would usually call the council and get everybody in, go arrest them, bring them. You know, you want to talk about swift justice. They tended to do this, especially when it came to matters of the temple. And honestly, they're at the temple. You know, they they could almost spit and hit the, the court of the Sanhedrin from where they're at, right? Where they're preaching at, can you put up that picture of the porticos? See how well it comes up on the screens. 
that is a, a, a that is a model representation of the porticos, and basically they would stand in these, and you could fit dozens of people in between those columns. That's how big this is. I want to say, uh, I, I can't remember, but I think that the walls on that are 150 feet high. That gives you an idea of the immenseness of this. You know, and they would fit, and there'd be groups, there'd be like a church over here, and then there'd be another sect over here, and then other teachers in the corner. The corners were the best places. There was more empty space. But it gives you an idea. So that's Solomon, you know, that's a, a, an example of what Solomon's porticos look like. That's where the apostles were teaching at, in the temple, in the place that had said, if you keep doing this, we're going to hurt you. And they were like, okay, and then they went and taught, right? So they keep doing this, and, you know, they, they arrest them and take them off, and you can take that picture down now. And here's, here's the thing. As we look at this, um, you know, this is where I kind of break with some commentators and stuff like that because I, I don't really see this here because, um, you know, if, if you look at it, um, in chapter 5, verse 17, it says, the high priest rose up, all those who were with him. They were filled with indignation. Some of your translations may say jealousy. Um, and it can be translated that way. But the jealousy they're, they're experiencing is not like the jealousy you and I think of when they do this. They're not just looking at the apostles and going, oh, man, you got all our people. Right? That's not what it is. It's, you know, though that kind of jealousy can make you real stupid real fast, you know what I'm saying? But it's not that kind of jealousy. The word is in, in indignate, the indignation there is zealous in the Greek, which we get our word zealot from, okay? So it's like they have this, it's an incredibly deep devotion to something. It doesn't matter whether it's right or not, you're devoted to it. So even if it's wrong, you know, I'm standing behind it. I'm going for it. This is happening. So, you know, it doesn't matter that it's wrong or right or anything. They're completely and wholly devoted to this. And this goes back to the act that in their minds, what they're doing is they think they're serving God in doing this. You get that. That's why I, I, I like indignation as a translation for this better, because it's that righteous indignation. It's how could you claim to speak for God? It's the same thing that Jesus talked about and told him in, in, in John 16, 2. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God a service. So even in doing this, even in arresting the apostles, the disciples, they really do believe that they're doing God right. Um, and technically, even though they made up the law last time they had the apostles in there, Technically, they're breaking the law. Sound familiar when somebody in authority and power makes up the laws as they go? You know, it's like they bring you in, realize they don't have anything over you, so then they make up a law, send you back out, and then arrest you again for doing the same thing that was not against the law earlier. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? I'm not going to point anything out. I'm hoping most of you guys know what I'm talking about. And here, what do they do? They don't, this time, they don't put them in the holding, which was the holding for the trial. Last time they had did it, it was almost a private thing. But here, they arrest them in public, and they put them in public jail. Um, uh, the public jail in Jerusalem had open bars open to the street. People would stand there throwing food, mocking, looking at them. And here, the apostles, they're arrested publicly and put in jail. Um, so, you know, so that's what it means when it says the common prison. But what happens? There's always a but, right? Verse 19, right? There's always, when, when God's involved, there's always a but to it. But God, right? Uh, verse 19, but at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Oh, man, and when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. Okay, so this, this happens as you look at this. This is one of the things, just kind of note, the angel comes to break them out. There's no description of the angel. But can you, you know, just imagine that. Imagine if you were in prison, you know, in Syria or Saudi Arabia for preaching the gospel. 
and this man came in. You know, and you're in a place, they've locked you down. You know, you may have even been beaten when you were put in there. And then this guy walks in, and the door just opens, and he walks in. And he says, hey, go and share about Jesus the same place you got arrested. Now. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? Here you are. I mean, you've already seen. They've seen Jesus raised from the dead. But now it's like God's given them personal, you know, personal interactive commands. And here this angel comes and they and they hear this. And when they walk out, because, again, the guards were the same as the Roman guards. You know, if you weren't guarding and you weren't doing your job, there was a sword waiting at the end of that for you. It, it made it tended to make people obedient to staying on watch. Right. The lack of description here, to me, says it's not an angel they've seen before. It doesn't say he was glowing white or anything like that. Um, And that tells us that there, of course, is more than one angel. We know this. But one of the things that it says, it doesn't say they snuck out, right? You know, I I don't think it's kind of like the History Channel or NBC's version of it where they're all, you know, dun, 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 you know, going around the corners and hiding in the shadows you know, it, it, he, it says he brought them out. He just brought them out. Come on. You know, I, and I wonder, because the guards were on duty. As far as they knew, the doors remained locked the entire night. So did the apostles perceive it that way? Um, were the guards just standing there, you know, not aware of what was going on? You know, were, were they just, were their minds blown? What was going on? I, I don't know. It doesn't explain it to us. But it's one of those things that I, I just I want to know when it comes, right? So, so what happened there? Did did you know? Was there like, you know, were they were they hypnotized? Were did they just stop and did you freeze time around the guards? What'd you do? You know, I, I kind of want to know. Um, but that's just me because I'm you know, weird at times. But can you imagine as this comes into this? Because you guys know when when you're in authority, when you're in power, and you say come you expect people to come you know it's like when you've got a well-trained dog and you say heal you expect the dog to heal uh when you're the boss of everything and you can fire somebody in a second you say hey you need to go do this and that person doesn't do it you're like you're in trouble now because i'm the boss right here the sanhedrin literally has power over people's lives and they have arrested these guys and they put them in jail and then they say you know, they're all sitting there and they've got that pomp and circumstance and bring them forth, you know, that kind of thing. And then the guy comes in and goes, they're, they're not there I don't know where they are, <laughs> right? You know, when the officers came, verse 22, and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported saying, indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. So the guards have no idea what's going on. When we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. In the popular parlance is what's going on and what's next. Because when something like this happens, this isn't, did they break out? Is there a rebellion? What's going to happen? You know, because they've they've experienced these things. There have been rebellions. Um, You know, not long before this with Barabbas and some of the other guys, they actually did a violent rebellion. And this is the kind of thing that gets people killed. So for some of these guys, they're just like, what is going on? What's happening? Verse 25. So one came and told them, saying, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and preaching the pe- you know, and, and teaching people, right? So random dude, you know, it doesn't say that he was one of the Sanhedrin or anything. You know, it's kind of funny to me. It's almost like I see a guy and he's walking by the Sanhedrin and they're all freaking out. He's, oh, yeah, they're out there, you know. That, that's what I think happened. I really do. You know, the guys just, you know, yeah, they're out there teaching and that's it. And they keep going. Right. And, and so. You know, they, you know, they freak out. And, and you know, the, the thing about somebody in authority is, is when you mess with that authority, 
the way that they perceive their authority and their power, when you challenge it, it, it just gives, it makes them rise up in them. But when they go out to find them, the captain, verse 26, went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. Okay, so normally going and gathering, cap, you know, uh, escaped prisoners wouldn't have been a nice thing. You know, they wouldn't have read them their Miranda rights and all that, right? They would have grabbed them, you know, you know, do some like Russian cop justice on them, right? Or, you know, uh, you, you, some countries, you don't want to mess with the cops. You just don't, right? Um, and they have, they have ultimate authority here. They could literally beat them all the way. They did it to Jesus. They beat him all the way to his trial. The only thing they couldn't do was kill him without the authority of Rome. And that's one of the things that happened with Jesus. The only thing that might get you out of a beating and things like that is, number one, you were rich and your family was connected and they knew who you were. Two, you were popular if the people were behind you. And that's exactly what happens here. They're like, oh, they're really popular. you know. So when they go to arrest them and all these people are around them listening to their teaching, they're like, yeah, come with us, right? That we're not going to, no violence, we're just going to take you. And they take all the apostles in. Verse 27, and when they have brought them, they set them before the council. So let's put that council pick up there, would you? So this gives you an idea of what the Sanhedrin looked like. So they have all these stone benches back here in the back, and you can see the chamber of Yun stone right here is where they would meet. This is a room that was sectioned off inside the priest's courtyard. So, you know, and, and you've got 71 members, the 35 on one side, 35 on the other, and they literally, if they came in, the numbers had to be just right on either side. They didn't like odd numbers. They, you know, it was, again, the idea of perfection. And, and then the high priest in the middle and the accused would stand there. And, you know, even though you see the clerks there, it's not always, you know, it's not like we have the prosecutor and the defendant. Oftentimes the defendant was whoever was standing there being judged. Okay. Um, and that was their Supreme Court. That was it. And you could, Jesus stood there. And here the apostles are standing in that same place again, right? Again. And the high priest asked them, verse 28, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. You see something missing there? That name, right? They won't even say it. Well, they won't even say it, this man. You're trying to get his blood on us. It was the Romans that killed him, right? Note as well, you know, we, we gave you a law. We made you a law, and you're not obeying it. And what is it they accuse him of doing? Filling people with doctrine. Okay? They aren't just going out and preaching in Jesus' name. They are teaching the word of God and looking to find Jesus in it. They're not just going out and preaching, 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 preaching. They are teaching the word of God. They are teaching people doctrine. This is what it means to believe. This is what Jesus did. This is what it means. They plainly teach it. And, you know, it, again, they have been in a three-year course with the master himself, so now they're teaching others how to be disciples. Um, you know, they're plainly instructing them what it means to be a follower in, in the experience of grace as they know it up to this point. They're even still growing in their knowledge of what, you know, of everything that Jesus did. And again, guys, we're going to get to heaven and still be going, wow, never would have saw that. Right. We're we're going to be continuing to learn about him through the ages. Uh, you know, again, they, they they put this spin on it. You guys. Jesus was killed by Rome because he was this, you know, he was a blasphemer and all this good stuff. And you guys are trying to put the, you know, it's that spin, man. It doesn't matter who's in charge. They're always spinning everything. 
It doesn't matter whether they're Republican or Democrat. It was somebody else's fault. You know, again, if we get a Republican in office this November, you know, everything that goes wrong is going to be somebody else's fault, right? In the past eight years, it was somebody else's fault. The years before that, it was somebody else's fault. As long as dudes are in charge, they're spin or do debts. Okay, I'm not I'm not leaving anybody out, right? But Peter, verse 29, and the other apostles answered and said, "Okay, oh man, again, just like they did before, we ought to obey God rather than men." But they don't just stop there. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus. Whom you murdered, they don't, they don't give them Rome, right? Whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. So he also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Wow. That's a defense, man. That's like a super majestic defense. That's doctrine right there. There's so much teaching just wrapped up in that little bit right there. You know, because, and and it's again reminiscent of Acts chapter 4, verses 19 through 20, where Peter and John said, whether is it right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And Peter and the boys bring a few things out here, okay? Um, Is that obeying God rather than men? The whole point of the Sanhedrin, its whole job in their minds, and as it was originally constructed, was to enforce the word of God. To bring people and to be rightly and fairly judged. But again, when people become powerful, it can often corrupt them. Um, and, and it's something wrong with someone who is supposed to be enforcing the word of God and recognizing the word of God to come against it. And this is one of the things that Peter brings out in this. He basically says, you're not doing your job because God has told us to do this in everything that has been seen and done by us since Jesus has risen from the dead kind of proves it, Right. So it's plain that the apostles are being obedient here and the Sanhedrin are being obedient to their own desires. Um, Whereas the apostles are being led by the Holy Spirit, the Sanhedrin is being led by their flesh. And they say, the God we all worship. The Sanhedrin knows exactly what God they're talking about. And And they point out that gave us Jesus, which... The Sanhedrin, number one, didn't believe in, in, in an afterlife. They didn't believe in an eternal life. They believed that they were you, you're simply created on the earth, you worship God, you die. If you don't worship God well, you don't live well. They didn't believe in angels and resurrection and all these other things, right? So the Sadducees who believed this, they comprised the majority of the Sanhedrin, okay? So that's, that's why I kind of make the connection there. And then he points out to them, you murdered him. Okay? So number one, to any Pharisee sitting in the audience, he's telling them, and he's also telling the Sanhedrin or the Sadducees, he's saying he preexisted, which is a huge no-no because even the Pharisees didn't believe that we preexisted, though we were known it was because God knew us from, you know, from time immemorial. But he is saying literally that Jesus was given as he was into our earth, right? Uh, That's one of the things we know from John chapter 1. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then we remember too, you know, they are talking and and uh, all the apostles know the teaching that they got from Jesus. They remember the parables of Jesus. They remember the parable of the vineyard owner, okay? And it's one of the things that Jesus had said about the parable of the vineyard owner, he had said, you know, the vineyard owner, he sends servant after servant, and, and the people, in, in the, he's looking for the fruit from the vineyard. And all of the fruit that he's looking for, they kill every servant, and finally, he sends his son. And when he sends his son, he kills him. 
So Jesus asked the guys at that time, he said, what will the owner do? The religious leaders answered, he'll destroy the wicked and give the vineyard to those who will render the fruit to the master. And Jesus is just like, hello, are you listening, right? And here's the thing, when they when they do this, when they say this, they are reminding them that the judgment that they make against the move that God is doing will judge them. That's one of the reasons that Jesus, I didn't come to judge. You're going to judge yourself by what you do, right? And then he says, you hung him on a tree. Uh, that reference, and a lot of people get, you know, there are actually some people that base whole doctrines and thoughts and philosophies on that statement right there. And basically, they are referring to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. And the idiom in the Hebrew there is not that it is a literal tree or a pole as some people teach. It simply means to be hung up on wood. When they refer to this, they're referring it as, the, you know, they're literally telling that it is the cross. The cross was that tree that Jesus was cursed, cursed by God. You see. Because to hang somebody like that was to curse them, to put a curse of God on them. And you and I know that he was cursed on our behalf. He took our curse upon him. This is the thing that God has done for us. So, you know, again, when Peter's teaching this to someone who's not a believer, it's a rebuke. It's an accusation. How dare you accuse me of this, right? To you and I... We know, and, and here's the thing, the Pharisees, some of the Pharisees are getting it because we're going to see later on that they're becoming believers, okay? But here's the thing, man. You and I hear it and we go, thank you that you hung on that tree for us. But the, the guys who were standing there hearing this from Peter, you know, they're starting to spit nails and froth up. You know, and they're just getting worse and worse and worse. Isaiah 53 says that he is a curse for us. And then they mention the one thing. Remember, we talked about this. The Pharisees taught it. The Sadducees taught it. If you were born a Jew, you're forgiven. Okay, you're you're in. You're chosen, promised to God. You're gold. You're good. Right. And then he Peter says to these guys, who have been told their whole lives, who were born being told, who have studied everything in the Bible, and, it, and they believe that it tells them that they are in, you need to repent. You need forgiveness. That's huge, man. That's huge. Because you're, you know, you're telling me, that's one of the reasons that the Pharisees went to John, because John was baptizing Jews. And, the, and they're just like, you, I need forgiveness? Oh, you did not, right? Oh, no, you didn't. Uh, and that's literally what happens, man. Um, and Peter, who is the, probably the spokesperson for this because he just couldn't keep his mouth shut, right? He's like, you know, he, he refers to Deuteronomy 17 and 19 when he's like, ain't just me. It's all 11 of us. Can you imagine the other 11? Like, what, dude, what? Right? Because he's like, all us. We know this to be true. And the, their Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing will be established, right? But he's saying here, he's saying this Holy Spirit is doing this. It's not just us. And he's telling you from each and every one of us, all 12 of us here representing the tribes of Israel. And at that very moment, he fulfills John fifteen twenty six, When the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father... The spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify of me and each and every one of them. They don't testify of power. They don't testify of fate. They testify of Jesus Christ and talk about the bestowing of his Holy Spirit. And when they say that, the Pharisees know he's talking about Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, 33 and 34. 
And it says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And Peter is saying to them, guys, this is happening right now. And even though these guys, they know the word, but they don't apply the word to themselves. And that's a huge problem with a lot of people who get to a certain place in in the church, in in the synagogue, in the whatever, because it's you know this all applies to you guys, not to me, right? But the implication that the apostles are saying is that you are not saved. And you tell a religious person that they're not saved, and they get bent way out of shape. So, though it begins with a plot to kill them, I call this next section bailed out again. Look at verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves that what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, uh, Theudas rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. They don't even have that, right? He was slain. All those who obeyed him were scattered, came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census, drew away many people after him. He also perished. And all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. We've seen it happen over and over again. But if it uh, is of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest you even be found to fight against God, remember those words, because we're going to see those come back to light later when one of his students meets and experiences those words ringing in his ears. Right. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go so that they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Wow. Wow. That's so awesome, man, because now this Gamaliel is the same one that taught Paul. In Acts 22.3, um, Paul says that he was brought up in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel. Um, so Gamaliel was a teacher of the law. He was a Pharisee. Um, and Paul was basically probably one of the things that would happen a lot is with these great teachers of the law, they would bring their children after they bar mitzvahed, you know, at the age of 13, because you were an adult then, right? That was pretty much, you're 13 now, go get a job. Start looking for that wife, you know? Life is short. And so they probably, you know, Paul, he may have been as young as 13 when he was brought to Jerusalem and left there by his father to be raised in this school. They would pay a certain amount of money, and then the young man would also work for the school and work for his teacher and learn, you know, in an incredibly close way. So that's one of the reasons as we look at this and when you begin to understand this is Paul, who is intimate with Gamaliel, who knows his teaching more than most people, is incredibly, we're going to see later on in the book of Acts, we're going to see is incredibly violent against the church. So the normal teaching of Gamaliel is not friendly towards what the apostles are teaching. You get that. Okay? I just want you to understand this is not an enlightened man. Okay? This is not an enlightened man. This is a man that though he does not know, though he does not believe, the Holy Spirit is moving upon him to show him truth. This man is familiar with the Tanakh, which is all the Old Testament. Um, You know, the Pentateuch, we talked about this. The Pentateuch is those first five books of the Bible. The Tanakh is the entire Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, as as we call it, or our our Old Testament. 
And later we're going to see in Acts 15.5 that some of the Pharisees actually begin to come to believe. And there is a legend that Gamaliel, Nicodemus, and many of these other powerful Pharisees came to be believers. I think Gamaliel is a, a, a big argument back and forth because the Jews really liked him. Um, but here's the thing. As we come into this and we, you know, again... He hears things that he knows and understands because of his knowledge and understanding of the scriptures. And he counsels this wisdom, I believe, by a prompting of the Holy Spirit. And basically just the call for patience, again, is one of those things, if this is God, we can't fight against it. But even with this, it escalates from where it was before, right? Because before they got what? A stern rebuke. Now they get a beating. They're flogged. Okay? And this is a beating. This is not, you know, put your hand out, whack with a ruler or something like that. Okay? They flog these guys. Usually the rods were about as big as your thumb. And they would have had everybody, you know, put your hands out, whack, whack. You know, hit them until they got tired and move on to the next guy, right? Um, and this is, again, a fulfillment of Matthew ten seventeen. Beware of men. They will deliver you up to the councils and scourge you in their synagogues. In the very place where they should feel such a part of Israel, where they are being obedient to God, they're being punished for it. And they know it's coming. Jesus is already, you know, they've got to be standing there going, yeah, I think we got a beating coming, guys. Right? We done it, and they did everything just right. They healed people, man. Think about that. They have touched people, and watched them come to life. Watch them be filled with with the Holy Spirit. They have been obedient, and most of us would go, you know, God, I did everything right. I can't believe you let that happen in my life. Where were you? They don't do that, man. They go, man, he let us get a beating, right? They're not happy about the beating. They're happy that God allowed them to represent his name. Jesus was whipped and nailed to a cross. I got a beating, big whoop, right? They count it as a privilege, as a joy. Why is that? Because this life is not all there is, man. They, they've seen Jesus alive. They understand, you know, and, and that's one of the things you've, you've received the Holy Spirit of God in your life. You know he's alive. You've experienced this. So why do we get so caught up in the world and everything? And we look at everything that happens to us in a negative light as a punishment from God when it's just life. Or it's the enemy trying to steal your joy. You know, and what did they do? They get this whooping. This flogging, right? Most of us, I could probably say, unless you grew up in the country way back when, probably never been beat like this. You know what I'm saying? Some of us have experienced things like this from parents. And, you know, you can probably associate with Jesus, with the disciples in ways that others can't because you've experienced that severe whipping. You know? And understand, I... I, I it doesn't justify anything that happens here. It doesn't mean that you should be going out seeking for people to beat you for the cause of Christ. But no matter what happens to us in our life, is anything does anything really outweigh the blessing of being able to completely and utterly serve him? He said to them, and he says to us, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. So what is all this? It's just what we got to live in right now. And, you know, the stock that I put into all this sometimes gets to be where I think that this is all there is. You know, for many of us, we experience this, you know, we think we're supposed to have an easy life once we become a Christian. You know, not not anybody here, but other people, right? Um, you know, we do. I, I mean, there are some times where I'm just like, why is this happening? You know, why is this falling apart? Why is that falling apart? Why, why do I feel this way? Yeah, why me, Lord? And he's just like, 
I don't know. I was there first. Why me, right? Or you. So you go do it for me. And, and it's one of those things, man, I, I, I don't want my faith to be an addendum or an addition to my life. For these guys, it was their life. You know, they were fully, completely, and wholly sold out. Again, most people would say, well, that was their calling. That was their ministry. The Bible says each and every one of us, every member is a minister. We are all ministers of the gospel of peace. If you know him, I mean, you got the Holy Spirit living in you, you know? I, I myself, I whine and wonder so many times if I'm doing the right thing. And, and sometimes that cripples me where I do nothing. And he doesn't call me to do that. These guys are literally whipped because they won't shut up. And sometimes I will hold my tongue and then wonder and then fight and then live in regret. Why? Because I didn't trust him. Because I wasn't willing for somebody to just look at me like I'm crazy instead of knowing it, right? You know, and I, and I just, you know, again, man, I, I encourage you guys because I wonder, is my hold of Christ complete in him? Do I really trust him so much that I'm willing to put myself out there? And that's a thing you've got to come to. Do you trust him so much that you're willing to do whatever it takes? You know, am I willing to lose it all? In Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 27, great multitudes were coming up. People were flocking to see Jesus because of everything that he had done. And he literally turned around and looked at everybody and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Did I, did I really die to my flesh? Did I really experience this? He finishes in Luke 14, 33. He says, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. It sounds hard, but it's really not because it just comes to an understanding that there's absolutely nothing you can do to save yourself. You need him. Only he can save you. You cannot do it. You cannot earn it. You cannot, you cannot maintain it. You cannot hold on to it. Only he can do it. So what do I need to do? I just need to give it all up and see what he wants to do. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you right now, Lord, I pray that you would move upon each and every one of us. And as the worship team comes up, Lord, I, and we prepare for the communion, I pray that you would prepare our hearts, Lord, that we would be completely holy and totally sold out to you, Lord, that we would be willing to walk away from everything and anything to follow you. Lord, I pray and thank you so much that uh, even when we are obedient and things don't seem to be going right, Lord, you're right in the midst of it. You move upon us and you show us, Lord, as the disciples, Father, uh, as, the, as the apostles experience this, uh, this harshness, this beating, this punishment for doing what is good, holy, and right. That, Father, there will be times where we are obedient and things don't seem to go right. But that is the way of the world. Those are, those are the promises that we don't tend to claim. But, Lord, as we come to you right now, we pray that you would take those burdens off of us, that we would not get hung up on what's happening to us in this life, in this world, and we would just rest in you, that we would, Lord, just give everything. Holy totally sold out to you, your disciples, Father. We pray you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you would remain seated, um, what we're going to do is uh, Glenn's going to bring up the communion trays and give them to you, and you're just going to pass them down the rows, and then he'll collect them again in the back. When you get your elements, hold on to them, and then we'll take them.